some topics to share about nonprofits and tech. Um, and remember, the programs are free, and most of them often have 100% time at pizza. So, <laughs> <laughs> can't beat that. Um, yeah. I'll introduce Terry in a second, uh, but first I wanted to go around the room, and uh, since we're about networking as well, so we'll say our names and who we're with, and then, then I'll introduce Terry, and I've mentioned no, Susanna earlier with Radio Radio Strategies, and Dale. And I'm Dale Thompson, also one of the organizers, and uh, a nonprofit specialist in QuickBooks and accounting for nonprofits. And I've um, been in different roles in different nonprofits. And so I represent a, a few that are my clients. How about Karen? Karen Appleton, I am a a, actually a major gift nonprofit fundraiser, but I um, ended up accepting, over the years, accepting projects that were in remote locations that required me to do most work on myself. So I had to adopt technology to do that. So I became a big time geek. And there's like, now there is nothing I can't do in a remote location <laughs> without, you know, thanks to Intend. That was actually, uh, I cooked up with N10 officially as a volunteer in, I guess, about 2009. And they helped me so much solve these problems of having no staff and having to do a lot of really important work that I was loyal for life. <laughs> so there you go. That's what I do now, Austin. Hey everyone, I'm Daniela Nunez, and I'm a social media manager at Consumer Reports for their advocacy division. Um, most people know Consumer Reports as rating products, and we also do a bunch of advocacy on a range of consumer issues. And I have been going to N10 conferences for at least eight years, so I like the community. Uh, I'm Caitlin Gilmore. I have a background of working in various nonprofit databases as their CRM administrator, and uh, I just accepted a position with the Defenders of Wildlife. I'm Hannah Hong. Um, I'm with Get Pulse, the platform, and then I also um, have a, a long kind of career and a passion for um, Asian American nonprofit work in particular. Um, I used to work for foundation communities as um, a social worker, um, and I recently just left the city of Austin's Asian American Resource Center as their um, education coordinator and acting supervisor. So my role in Get Pulse now is um, community engagement success manager. So if you guys have any questions about that or have organizations that want to learn and get to know the platform a little better, I'm here to help. I've been using it for five years without being paid for it. Um, <laughs> so I was like, well, you know, this is a really wonderful opportunity. And like four of the nonprofits I've been in or um, been supporting um, were already using it. So it was an easy decision for me to make. And along with that, hopefully I'm part of the Awesome Foundation um, trustee board. And we fund uh, projects with $1,000 micro grants every month. And uh, no strings attached, which is very rare to find now. Mm -hmm. um, I also sit on the board, um, or I'm part of the team that does the Austin Asian American Film Festival. We recently did a really huge uh, Crazy Rich Asians event at the Long Center. So fun. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, awesome. please go see it. It's <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions about like, the Asian American community or or get pulse, um, really a resource for all of that. And I've been using technology um, in the nonprofit sphere since I was a student um, in college. And I sit on the board of something called Inter Intercollegiate Taiwanese American Students Association. Um, so these are students that year to year, they are connecting from all over uh, the US. And we have to use technology in order to run the organization. So I sit on the board that's alum that um, kind of manage like the five one some other higher level things to keep it going year to year. I'm Kara Breyer. Uh, this is my first um, meeting. Uh, I've been a programs manager here in Austin for a long time, more than five years, six years now. Um, I worked at the Central Texas Food Bank for five years and then a couple months ago I moved over to the Art of Texas. So I, 
I use tech, but that's not necessarily, you know, there's other people on staff that help me with it. Um, so a lot of the things I've learned I've just taught myself. Um, so I'm super excited to learn more. I'm also with the Young Nonprofit Professionals Network of Boston. So we're a network of nonprofit professionals. We provide accessible monthly professional development. So I would love to collaborate with y'all. Um, we're actually doing a survey right now of 100 nonprofit executives. And something that came back from what competencies they want are technical skills in tech. Um, so I definitely think there's some collaboration to be done. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Yes. Uh, my name is Joseph Vasquez. Uh, I'm on the board of Drive Senior, and I've been in technology all my life as a network engineer in various uh, technology positions. But uh, and now I actually have my small business where I do some tech consulting and that kind of stuff. But uh, I've been with Drive Senior about three years, and we're still we've been around for a long time. Your organization has, but <clears throat> we're very behind in technology. So even though I have a really strong background in technology, I want to learn more about the applications of the software that is going to benefit that really are useful for nonprofits. So that's my aim today. Uh, there's a lot of different areas that I know that we can improve on. Uh, there's also the issue that we, well, being kind of a senior, we work with a lot of seniors, which I am too, but Luckily, I've worked with technology all my life, and most seniors don't know that they're not known with technology and they're really afraid of it. So, we're, we use a lot of tech, I'm trying to use more technology with our organization, but at the same time, we want to use it as part of how we interface with the seniors. So, we kind of learn how to do that. Hey, my name is Ali Ara. I just moved to Austin from New York City. Uh, we're happy to help me super for profit organizations, not non-profit, which were policy banks. And, you know, uh, my job was to help them to uh, not to be bailed out again by taxpayers' <laughs> money. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think that's the greatest non-profit thing that you could do, you know, in reality. So, but but I was paid for it. Uh, uh, so uh, my job is highly analytical. We use analytics. War, anything, uh, and how they're going to impact the, the largest financial institution in the U.S. <coughs> and how they can avoid it, how they can bail themselves out by their own capital. So they have to have a certain level of capital uh, as a form of offer and insurance for contingencies in the future. But anyway, long story short, I just moved here. Uh, um, uh, my background has nothing to do with what I've been doing in management in New York. I have a PhD in engineering, but uh, I was at Houston uh, when I graduated. I really wanted to stay in Texas, but the economy was really bad at the time because of oil and gas prices. So I had to drive. I just put my stuff in the front of my car and drove 2,400 miles to New York to find a job. And when you go to New York, you end up to work for one of those either Wall Street banks or management consulting firms will help them, or Broadway, so I had nothing to do with Broadway, so. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'm excited to be in Austin. I really want to leverage, um, I'm here to build my own client base in technology consulting, but at the same time, I would love to contribute to the community and Austin, and in nonprofit sector. Uh, so I think it was a long okay. introduction. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. And I will introduce Terry uh, and uh, a couple of notes. I'm going to take some pictures. Let me know. And probably a back of people's heads in the audience, but just if you're like, oh, uh, don't post anything of me, I'm okay with that. I'll just delete it. Um, but, um, and we'll go until about 7.30 or 7.45-ish uh, today. Um, so we're gonna, uh, so Terry Walker is here from Dallas, thank you. She's, uh, in 2014 she created Common Terry Services to help nonprofits and small businesses with uh, their goods, have some good software infrastructure. And she is also town 
Volunteer Services is also certified and experienced with Salesforce Cloud, Sales Cloud, Salesforce Community Cloud, QuickBooks Online, and more. So she's going to talk today about software integration in Salesforce and low cost and free options that integrate, integrate with Salesforce. Please help me welcome Terry Walker. <laughs> Thank y'all for having me out. Looking forward to talking with you all. Uh, when Caroline and Susanna were talking to me about what should the topic, the title be, throughout the idea of the well-integrated Salesforce platform and the path to software peace. And, <laughs> and so what we're gonna talk about today, I am a Salesforce consultant. I do not work for Salesforce or represent Salesforce. Um, but I uh, consult on Salesforce, just like one might consult on QuickBooks. Do a little of that as well. And my background, I worked in software implementation and development for about 10 years for some companies in Dallas. And then had a moment where I'm like, you know what I really want to do is I want to work for a nonprofit. So I went into nonprofit management and did that for about 10 years and then realized like, hey, wait a second, nonprofits, need better technology and so took both of my passions of supporting nonprofits and having a lot of fun with software and turned it into a job. So far so good, we're nearly four years in. So uh, I'm going to start off today talking about do you need software peace? So now that I've been listening to different folks talking and we've got a blend in here of consultants and folks working for nonprofits and when I talk about software peace what I'm talking about is when you sit down in front of your computer to go about your job, are you happy with the tools that you have? Okay, John, why not? And Caitlin, right? Yes. Okay, what, what, why aren't you happy? They don't integrate well. They don't integrate well? No. And uh, there's, there's also a data governance issue where people are able to keep things off of the database. And it's, it's like if it's not in the database, it's, it doesn't exist. Not a beautiful and accurate report. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please pull the report. The data is somewhere yes. in a file cabinet. But you'll, you'll be fine. Okay. Anyone else that's not at Software Peace? Is everyone else at Software Peace? Mm -hmm. Tell me your name again. Me, Kara. Kara. Um, I would just say that I don't know how to effectively use this software to the ability that it should be used. Okay because of lack of training, literally no training. Right. Just figure it out, right? Like Excel, I mean, like, oh yeah, everyone took Excel in high school. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. You're a millennial, you know social media and software, right? I mean, my God. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, no, exactly. Anyone else? The box, I mean, but you're on uh, certain models in my work. Uh, crashes on me a lot. Being the only spot for the product. Mm -hmm. That's what I saw was that if you're an early adopter. 
adapter or your easy, like your, you can easily adapt your software, you're going to be the Spock mm -hmm. for everything. <laughs> yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Anyone else? Well, a lot of us need some software apiece. Even, even in our own day-to-day -day lives, you get the new phone, you get the new app, whatever happened to a training manual. Like, there's no training manual. Even if there was a training manual, who's got the time to watch 38 hours of YouTube videos to figure all of this stuff out? <laughs> I literally just wanted to order a pizza with my phone. Why, have I, why am I now angry? Um, So I want to start off with, um, oh, hang on, what am I doing here? Me and, can I mention one thing? Yes, please do. I, even though I do major gift fundraising, sometimes I go into an organization and it ends up being software questions, you know, so I have to go and figure out if it will work or not work. But here's the thing for Austin, okay, that I have found uh -huh. a lot, is, they think they're going to be more business-like, more perceived as more business-like, perceived as a startup, you know, if they use Salesforce. Interesting. And I actually have gotten on Salesforce and it, all that salesy kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. it, to me, it's, I'm a real development officer, so it's not, doesn't really fit my brain, but uh, I just want you to know that it's really, Salesforce just has a panache for being a sales tool, a businessy tool, mm -hmm. and it maybe will help nonprofits make that transition and be perceived as smarter and more cutting edge. Yes. I've seen it over and over, I go, fair enough, I just want this other one. Give me my Excel spreadsheet. Hard fire me Well, I promised when I came here today, okay, so. there will be no <laughs> sales pitch of Salesforce for me today. Um, I know why I use Salesforce, and I'm gonna talk about why okay. I use Salesforce, but I'm also gonna say, if you're sitting there and you're like, I hate Salesforce, okay, that's all right. There's no <laughs> one tool for everybody, and I am okay with that. And we're gonna talk about some of the reasons why, and I will not try to convince you to use Salesforce, I promise. Thank you. <laughs> I won't even judge this. <laughs> there. So I have a slide and clearly I struggle. Talk about needing software piece. Yeah. I, I struggle with PowerPoint. I know that everyone and their dog has figured out PowerPoint and I'm like, I clicked it on my end but you didn't see it. So there you go. Okay, slide number three. Um, a piggy bank and a checking account both work fine for holding money. Hey, we need to hold some money. Here's a piggy bank, here's a checking account. And here's something, a piggy bank is way cheaper then a checking account, maybe, maybe not, it's hard to say. But if you want to report on stuff, the piggy bank's not going to work so well for you, right? We get this. And depending on where you sit in the hierarchical tree in your, in your nonprofit, or your organization, or the folks you're consulting with, sometimes I sit down with nonprofits and I feel like I'm having this discussion. Like, we've put everything in a piggy bank, and now we want to report. Like we've got it on this spreadsheet over here, we've got it in a file cabinet, we've stuffed it over here. Oh, Mary has an amazing set of contacts in her Gmail. Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, and now it's time to report on stuff. And you're like, well, this is not helpful at all. And it's also a good thing to talk about, a lot of times when nonprofits think about data, what I see a lot of, and maybe you've experienced this in nonprofits you've worked with, sometimes I see nonprofits thinking about software as a repository for data. Like, well, we need to put it in the repository. Like, well, that's, actually a checking account's not really that either, right? You put money into your checking account, but you're also spending money and you've got transactions and it's working for you. And I find a lot of nonprofits that they think of their database as something that is almost against them. It's like, fine, I'll, I'll go and put the data in the database. Mm -hmm. Let it sit there. And, and they treat their data like it's something that it's something that's just has to be shoved over someplace. 
instead of treating whatever software tool they're using as a tool that helps manage the process. Because if all you're doing is using a software to just stick stuff in, and you don't want to get reports out, or you're not trying to manage your business processes, really doesn't matter what tool you have as long as you can get the data out. And, and that's, where, that's where a lot of conversations start with me with nonprofits. Like, what do you want to do with your data? What are your business processes? Now, this, this gets to another conversation in nonprofit land. If you're like, what are your processes? And now you're laughing. I don't, right, Danielle? Like, <laughs> good question. Good question, right. They're like, okay, technology will not solve not having processes. Technology won't bring you processes. It may enforce some restrictions on you, but technology, a software package, no software package is going to come in and bring you the answers. Like that's the, like sometimes what you actually need is a business process. And then finding software that takes your business process and helps make it more efficient, collects the right data. Now this gets to my conversation about, Caroline, what you were saying. Is it Caroline or Carolyn? Lynn. Carolyn. There is no right answer for everyone. There are definitely some wrong answers. So, and I, I believe this 100% of the time. Like there is, you start talking to folks and you're like, well, Salesforce? We don't need that. We've got everything working. And you're like, great. Don't change what's not broken. And if it's working for you, do go with that. But on the flip side, if your idea of a database is everyone has their own contacts in their own account and it's not integrated, and some data is sitting over in a file cabinet, and some data is sitting in, we, I have a moment. I love doing, I love doing play, uh, scoping out work. Going into a nonprofit, it's just like this great detective time. You come in and you're sitting down with the nonprofit, you're talking to them, and you're like, all right, we're going to have a moment. We are going to confess our spreadsheets. Get ready, <laughs> confess them. What spreadsheets? I don't care what you say your software is, I don't care what you say your business processes are. What are the spreadsheets that are actually running this organization? And if you ever go into a nonprofit, depending on where you are in the process, it, where you sit in the tree in the nonprofit, you go into the nonprofit and you're talking to folks, and if you just get the top folks in the nonprofit, if it's a nonprofit of 10 or more people, you start talking to them, you're like, where are the other people? Like, cause I bet, I bet you have your program manager, I bet you have your volunteer manager, I bet you have your development associate, they are running their lives. They have built systems because they didn't have systems that worked. And so what are their systems? And another thing, if you're looking at software, regardless of which software you're looking at or thinking about, a lot of times when you come in and you start talking with a consultant, the consultant wants to find out, particularly if the consultant already has a software that, they're, that they are a expert with, which is what you want anyways, right? That's a good thing. But if you're working with a consultant, a software consultant, and they start asking you, what are all your pain points? You make a huge list of pain points. You know everything you hate about your current system. <laughs> and the consultant leaves and goes and says, look, our solution fixes all of your pain points. It's awesome, except sometimes it's forgotten to ask, what do you love about your software? Or what is working with your software? And that's another, that's another way of looking at this too, because you might have some processes that are actually working really well. Like on the fourth of the month, the program management monthly report is getting done. It takes a while to do. It just takes a while to get done, but it's getting done, and you got it, and you get it to the executive director who gets it to the board, and things are fine. And then you get the new software system and go, oh, it doesn't have that monthly report that we've been using every single month for, for years now. So that's always kind of interesting to find out like what's, what's working, what's not working. Um, because you want to make sure if you're doing looking at changing software that you would find out what you already like. And I'm going to talk, and Carolyn, this I think speaks to as a development hat. Yes, neon. <laughs> yes. You're looking at all. 
If you're in a smaller nonprofit, donor management. They tend to not work well for management software. We know what your nonprofit, kind of how it's structured, the rest of the nonprofit. That's not uncommon to see. When you get into smaller nonprofits, that stuff all starts falling on top of each other. And so if you're in a situation where you're in a smaller nonprofit, and today you're working with donor data, let's back up. At 9 a.m. you're working with donor data, at 10 a.m. you're working with some volunteers, and then, oh, now it's time to get ready for our afternoon program. That's when you start looking at how can I integrate things together, because now stuff is starting to, starting to get discombobulated. Um, I'm going to pause there. I know, Dale, you said you do QuickBooks work. And I think someone else said they do accounting type work as well. Is that, did I hear that? I just never made that up. Yeah. It happens. Um, when we talk about free and low cost options for nonprofits, what I've seen a lot of nonprofits do, and I, Dale, you probably have seen this as well, is I see a lot of nonprofits going out and the development team and the program team and everyone is going out and they, we need to sell this t-shirt, check, and we need to get this donation, sign up for things that are free. They, they all have a charge, but you're like, whatever, everything's 3.5% or 3.75 or whatnot, that's fine, <laughs> great. But what happens on the back end from that, for your accounting folks, that's, each one of those is a different merchant account. And when you have a bunch of different merchant accounts, you have made your bookkeeping go from something that is small and manageable to a huge mess. Because now you're getting all these different reports. I, one of my clients that I went into a couple of years ago, we sat down and went through their merchant accounts. They had 11. They had Square, and they had PayPal, and they had something that was running Oh goodness, what's the big The accounting team is always angry at the fundraising team. Mm -hmm. like, this is why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so yeah, so the more hacks you've got going on, you really this is when you really need software integration and so that things will talk to each other. And I want to talk about what I mean by integration. When I talk about software integration, I don't mean you have to have one single tool, because sometimes that doesn't make sense. Um, but what I do mean by software integration is selecting a, whatever your tools are, is thinking through how do these talk to each other. Um, I'm going to flip over here in a second to my, to the internet, and I'm going to show you all some tools and just pull up some websites. I thought that would be easier than writing on my presentation what they have on their website, much better. But one of the tools I'm going to talk about is Zapier. It's a tool that is a third-party integrating tool. It has over 800 applications, and it lets you take and talk application to application. Now, on Ali talked about the, your concern with cloud-based solutions. I stand in the total other camp for nonprofit data. I'm like, go cloud, 100% go cloud, because as a nonprofit, particularly a smaller nonprofit, your biggest the money you don't have the know-how to manage a lot of to manage a lot of uh, hardware and get a server set up and get and keep your everything updated with the latest and greatest and and cloud-based solutions have gone through extensive security reviews and all of that you're as you're less likely to be hacked on that than you are in an unprotected server that you're trying to set up and maintain yourself. Um, but there's definitely, as with everything, there are multiple sides of the coin. But I am very much in the cloud, in the cloud camp. If you if, can, I jump in. Sure. Can you uh, tell us maybe three of the most secure cloud-based um, solutions? Well, I can. That's actually a spot where I can only talk about Salesforce because it's the only one that I have gone and gone through all the clicks through. But most. Cloud-based solutions, if you call them, if you call and talk to them and talk about their security, um, they will let you know what their certifications are, mm -hmm. what kind of certifications they have and how they, they manage their security. So, but like BlackBot, Salesforce, these are these ones are both large enough that they've got they've got that kind of up to them. Okay. Yeah. 
But I definitely want to talk about this for Salesforce. So I'm going to tell you why I like Salesforce and take it and go from there. So the, one of the reasons I like Salesforce, I'm going to talk about security first. It's Department of Defense qualified. Mm -hmm. So now that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean if you get a Salesforce thing like we could never be hacked. Now we all take and share the same login and we've got the password taped on the window, yeah. but we are so secure because Salesforce is Department of Defense qualified on security. Like that's the, the, the again, your biggest security risk is internal in a small nonprofit or in a mid-sized nonprofit. Uh, there's actually companies out there, if you're, if you're interested in this, let me know and I'm happy to connect you with some folks that do this. There's some companies that do security they do security um, reviews for companies and nonprofits, and what they do is they send out a fake phishing email to all of your staff members. <laughs> and then they come back and say, here's how many people clicked on this. Wow. Here's what they filled out. Here's what they told <laughs> us. And so it's like these little security. So it's very much, it's quite hacking. They try to see what's going on and then bring back to the organization that you are, security is something that's, that's your responsibility, like every single individual, it's their responsibility. What's the name of one of those companies that does that? I work with a company out of Dallas. They're, it's a managed services provider called NetRes. And so they're, they're a Dallas-based company. They, they do these security reviews. Um, it's always pretty interesting in that regard. So on Salesforce, I like it because it's, it's got the security pieces. It also has the infrastructure. So Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, Dell customer support, a lot of big groups are using Salesforce and a lot of your data right now is already stored in it somewhere with some organization. <laughs> and knowing that these organizations that are publicly traded and that have to meet certain requirements, that they're able to use Salesforce and it meets their needs, for me, as, a, as someone who works mostly with small and mid-sized nonprofits, I say your needs are smaller than this. So you can relax and know that someone's got your hardware taken care of for you. So that's a huge, that's a huge benefit to me that you've got a solution that's not gonna go down on you. It does not mean that you have no responsibilities. You never have to back up or have good not saying that you, every organization is responsible, has a responsibility for security and data management. So one of the things I love about Salesforce is its flexibility. So Salesforce is a platform that was originally de designed to do business to business sales, but from early on, they have done work to build a solution for nonprofits. And it's an extremely flexible solution for nonprofits called Nonprofit Success Pack. It brings in a lot of donor management pieces and also brings in a lot of volunteer management pieces. And they give away 10 free licenses to any 501c3, which I think has really fueled its popularity among nonprofits because quite honestly, we like, we like some free software. So, so it's, it's very flexible and you don't have to be a programmer to develop new things on Salesforce. Working with a client, she started using Salesforce in March. We had a conversation today. She's like, look at what I built. She has a library program that she checks out books to her students. She does adult literacy. And she checks out books to her students, and she built a library program on her Salesforce instance. <laughs> where she can check out a book to a student, and now she's reading about how to integrate a barcode reader to it. Super cool stuff. Really allowed, it's, it's a, and it works exactly for them, has the exact right information that she needs. So she's able to build that out and not be a programmer. Um, it's common usage. And when I talk about common usage, over, over 30,000 nonprofits are using Salesforce right now. Over 150,000 companies are using Salesforce. I think that comes out, last I heard, like 150 million users. It's a ton of people. They have a huge event every year in San Francisco called Dreamforce that has nearly 200,000 people attend. It's over the top. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of people are using Salesforce. The cool thing about that means there's lots of support options for you. So you can work with a Salesforce consultant 
and find them complete and total pain. Like, oh well, can't go do another one. So there's a ton of resources and a free computer-based training system and ways to get certified user groups. Austin has a nonprofit, a Salesforce nonprofit user group here. It also has a for-profit user group. So there's a lot of different user groups and different support areas that you can get that you can get help from. Pretty cool in that regard. Um, and that goes into the community support. And then automation to drive business processes. You can build in Salesforce, you can, there's, there's multiple tools for building automation. So if you want to take something and go from A to Z, and like when this date changes, go change that date and this status and send an email to Diane and then bring it all back in, and you can do all of these things. So that goes to the next side, where it's got high data management for if you're looking at something, I don't want to build anything. I just want to sit down, I want to type my stuff in, you tell me where to put my stuff, I'm going to type it, I'm going to do the thing that, that your stuff does, and this will be great. It, it's not that tool. Like, it's the tool for people who like to tinker with things. And if you're an organization that's like, we don't tinker with things, we just take these tools and use them. Don't do Salesforce, because it's not that tool. It's going to require someone in your organization to be your Salesforce person, to build out the reports you want, to build the automation you want. Uh, uh, just to clarify, sure. um, your Salesforce person, like, 10 hours a week? Like, not a full-time person you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Most, of, most of the nonprofits I work with do not have a full-time Salesforce person. Mm -hmm. But most of the nonprofits I have have someone who is, we even have a work with an accidental admin they make sense to be this person. Mm -hmm. And it's often the person who's already building reports. Because somebody in the organization is gathering all the data and building reports, and maybe that's they spend two, two weeks a month creating reports. Oftentimes, that's where the time comes from. They like build the report, and then they press buttons to get the report. Mm -hmm. And then they use that time for other Salesforce stuff. So, so and it, it really depends. I've got a couple of, I've got a couple of clients that, um, they pretty much let it go. Like they're just like, hey, it's it's running, it's good. <coughs> they do minimal stuff, and then we've got others that are like, oh, well, let's play with it, let's design cool things. So that really depends on the on the feeling that the nonprofit has. Um, and then the last thing, the user becomes a designer and a builder. Which you may be sitting in the room right now and think, that's awesome. I love this. I can design my business process and I can build it out on Salesforce. And if you felt that awesomeness, you might be a good Salesforce kind of person. If you heard that and said, that sounds terrible, why in the world would I want to do that? <laughs> you may not be a Salesforce person. That's okay. That is okay. But the cool thing about Salesforce with it's fun going to, there we go. Whoops. Oh, do I have two screens going? Well, let's fix that. Me too. Awesome. So I have I have a Salesforce screen open right now. Um, my work we've launched a new product called Literacy Nimbus. It is a free application that sits on top of Salesforce for organizations that do enrollment and attendance. So this is my demo site for it. But it shows some of the stuff that you can do with Salesforce. And, and it's really great for organizations that need to integrate their program pieces and their, and their um, donor pieces and their raw materials. So that's kind of where we see Salesforce coming into play. Now I'm going to talk about some free things that integrate with that. Um, with, if you are a Salesforce user and you want free software to go with it, or low-cost software. There's some cool things that you can do. And I talked about one of them, which is Zapier. And Zapier is a third-party integrator, where you don't have to be a programmer, but you can say, hey, when this happens over in my Google business apps, then make this happen in Salesforce. 
Or when I type this in, when I type this little field in Salesforce, go post for me in Twitter. Or whatnot. Is it always Salesforce part of the equation? No. Nope. Okay. No. Nope. It can be it can be anything to anything. So like I know a couple of nonprofits that use HubSpot as their CRM can be HubSpot to do the same things. Is it expensive? It's not. No, it's about 20 bucks a month for five zaps. And some, they've got some zaps that are uh, go, pricing. There we go. So they've got some things that are free. So any, any of their, they've got premium things and they've got non-premium things. Any of their non-premium stuff, you can do a lot of stuff for free. And um, then starting for $20 a month, you can do up to five zaps. Is what they call when you take one program and push it out to another program. Like, um, trying to think of other examples, fun examples. It, I mean, there's a thousand plus apps that they have. And an example I see a lot is people doing things with Google Forms. So when the Google mm -hmm. Form comes in, mm -hmm. then do this, mm -hmm. whatever this is. So the Google Form comes in, and maybe you send an email, or maybe you create a calendar event, or maybe you push it over to your CRM, um, or, or something like that. Do you? OK, I'm going to look into it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my suspicion, if you walk out of here with a lot of questions tonight, I will feel like I've done well. It also allows for integration with Eventbrite with things. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing Eventbrite now, a lot of things like Eventbrite have native integrations to Salesforce, which is another thing that MailChimp, Constant Contact, Eventbrite, they all have native integrations to Salesforce that they have built. But if you want to do something custom and interesting, you can use a tool like Zapier to do that. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, another tool that I like a lot is Vertical Response. Vertical Response gives 10,000 free emails to a nonprofit each month. So it is not list size driven. I will tell you, I, I am a geek. Maybe you are a geek as well. And I am not a visual person. So if you have someone who's a big marketing person, sometimes they are not as big a fan as verbal responses they are of a MailChimp and a constant contact. Like it has the ability to create pretty emails, what I consider pretty emails. But I don't think on the creation side it's as maybe user friendly, perhaps, as a MailChimp or a constant but on the integration side and the free side, it's really super cool. Mm -hmm. Another package that, that I recommend is Click and Pledge. Click and Pledge is a donation management tool. It, you don't have to be on Salesforce to use it, but it is built on Salesforce you might be happier if you were on Salesforce to use it. Mm -hmm. What I like about Click and Pledge is it has a ton of features. They are really active. They've got a peer-to-peer -to -peer tool. They've got a swiper. They've got just a ton of features that they've built in. And they do not charge a monthly fee. So you pay 3.75%. And you pay 3.75% plus, I think, 30 bucks of the transaction, something like that, it, you know, to just. Um, and that's inclusive of your merchant account fee. So that's kind of a cool thing if you're a nonprofit that needs a lot of features but you don't have the budget for some other giving solutions, then, then this might be a good, this might be a good thing to look into. It does require, anytime you hear free software, think free puppy every single time. Free software equals free puppy. <laughs> if you get free software, there is, there is a human capital price to pay for that because you're going to be doing some of the setup. So click and pledge is that way you build your pages. You can build beautiful pages. 
You can build the pages you want, as many pages as you want. But it's going to be more work than, say, if you use the tool like Classy. Are you all familiar with Classy? Mm -hmm. Like Classy, if you've got the $9,000 or $3,000 a year to get Classy, depending on the way you get it, um, Classy is amazing. I love it. It's so easy to use, and it's simple, and it's beautiful. And it's not expensive. So anything that's, so anything that's free doesn't mean it's not good. It just requires some human capital investment. And, and that's where a lot of times when we talk to nonprofits about, hey, free and low cost software, like, I want, do y'all know the pyramid? Good, fast, and easy. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you want things that are good, fast, and easy, but you only get to pick two. <laughs> <laughs> or good, fast, and cheap. Sometimes people say good, fast, and cheap. So, like, well, you can have good and cheap, but it's not going to be fast. <laughs> and so, so, like, that's. You know, that's, that's a good rule of thumb to use in the nonprofit world. Um, let's see. Let me flip back over here. Now, it is close to 7.30, so I'm going to pause here, because I could talk for a long time, clearly, and time got away from me faster than I thought. So I'm going to pause here and ask, what are your questions? And let's keep some time available for questions. Or what are some software programs that you're looking for? I think mean, sort of a philosophical observation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Having run into it because I end up being dropped in nonprofit environments and I have to just mm -hmm. figure out like you do, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, my, in fact, the Austin American Statesman, Monica Maldonado-Williams, I guess, did a okay article and she uh, quoted me in there and <laughs> she kind of took me out of context but basically it was there are so many great platforms out there mm -hmm. but how do you get the nonprofit staff to to acknowledge and take the time to learn really how to use it but they don't stop uh, so often to you know they'll just hack it as far as they can get Right. and to really learn how to use it thoroughly. And when they do that, it's wonderful right. what they can achieve. But it's uh, really a problem with all of these platforms and the shiny object syndrome. You know, it's like, oh, we're going to go away, and we're up there. Whoops, let's try that one. And you know, if they would really focus on one good, solid, highly rated you know, system right. um, or a team that integrates like mm -hmm. with your sales force and just really dig in and learn it, they're right. really going to excel. But I've seen uh, many nonprofits buy Blackboard. I've walked in at Blackboard, it's so expensive mm -hmm. at its full rate. I've literally seen them buy that $50,000 a year or something. Mm -hmm. And one person took a couple of courses to learn how to use it. They just never would no, get into it. it. So they yeah. just. What do you know? Yeah. I don't know how we all deal as a sector. That it, it just is such a huge problem is just literally stop to breathe and mm -hmm. to actually learn how to use it. I just feel so bad because I get in there one a one group I worked with had me on and I got in there and I just kind of dug in and it needed to be all cleaned up, worked for hours and days and months and got it working. But I couldn't get, you know, the program staff to input their data. I couldn't get the silos to break down. Right. And finally, they, they actually did, I think it was Salesforce. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they went. But I worked hard to make it, I tried to make Neon really uh, easy for them by learning it myself really right. intensely. But I, I'm just saying, I know that's a good picture. Like Forbes. Uh, did an article about how great technology is and how it's going to create your impact to your nonprofits, yada yeah, yada. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that and had great ideas, but I responded back to them on Twitter actually. I said, it, it, it's really a great idea to do all these things, but you know, the nonprofits get so busy that they don't stop to learn it. And it's just kind of a miss. Yeah, it, it is really interesting. I think should so we be looking for donors that say, Time out. We're going to pay for your time out. We know that you're freaking out about your fundraising. Just stop freaking out, and we're going to give you a month, and you're just going to sit in a classroom and learn how to do neon. 
buy all together and find out and w learn how to build teams. Right. I'm just saying it's a different concept, but I just think boards need to be aware of that also, that they really could, the whole nonprofit could shine. Right. But it's got to be, um, somehow all the pressures have to come off to perform in other areas so that mm -hmm. they can do that and realize the potential. I know how I know how I approach this with Salesforce. And it, it is it, again. This is where everything is different depending on you know. If, what's the what's that old saying? If your only tool is a hammer, the whole world's a nail. So so I know how I approach this on Salesforce because in Salesforce I build custom dashboards that help the nonprofit see their data. And what I often find is you build a pretty dashboard with a lot of colors and a lot of errors, and you put that in front of the executive staff. And that's when it's like, whoa, this is great, but what do you mean? 58% of our, of our people are, don't have an age, and all of our services are age-based. Like, well, I can only tell you what the data says. I can't tell you if the data, I can't tell you if this is right, but this is what the data says. And that's where I've seen people start buying that. And the mm -hmm. other fun thing is helping nonprofits, and I, and I don't know the answer to how to get folks there necessarily, but, Going into a nonprofit and saying, hey, how much time are you spending on not having a system? Right. Like, and I don't mean a database. Like, a database is the least of your concerns if you don't have any systems. Like, you cannot run an organization without some sort of a system. It doesn't have to be a fancy system, but can you sit down, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, let's put the sticky papers on the wall, and let's draw out a flowchart of this is what happens. And then if you can take your CRM or your donor platform or whatever tools you have, if you can then take and say, okay, here's where our platform can come in yeah. and make this process easier. And what you often find is like, okay, Naomi types this on this spreadsheet and then prints this report and then Sue takes it and puts it on another report, and then Larry takes it and does something else with it. And you're like, wow, is there any way your system could take that data and put it in once and then get it to all these different folks? Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's, sometimes it's a hard sell, but when you start finding all the time that nonprofits are spending right. not having that. This is what I think maybe it means that they, that boards need to be more uh, progressive and that there should be at least one member of the board that has a tech background that understands mm -hmm. this dynamic and can be called on to, to spot it and say that this has got to stop, you know, we're right. du duplicating effort or whatever, let's try this other thing. And, mm -hmm. and also, I, I don't know. I, I, I do, I, I'm the data, I was the database <laughs> administrator for a nonprofit that, you know, they had enough staff and enough need to dedicate a person to do that. Mm -hmm. And I know that that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Like, you usually need a certain size to do it. But um, I'm on forums online that deal with the, the data issue. And, you know, the question comes is like, hey, we're trying to switch away from our Excel spreadsheets. What should we switch to? And some people, they chime in to see if it's research, and, you know, and, uh, and then you'll get all the naysayers. But the one thing that people always said about Salesforce was that, do not get Salesforce unless you have a dedicated staff member to, to do it. Because if you just, it's not going to just set up and run. You have mm -hmm. to have a dedicated person to do it. Mm -hmm. That was something that always, that always, like across the board, that's a, one thing everybody agreed on. <laughs> it was that you had to have a dedicated staff mm -hmm. member. And I, I mean, you don't even, you don't have to have Salesforce. I, I think data, data governance is so important. Like, yeah. it came across some really hardcore people where they were given, they were in charge of data, they were larger larger enterprise with their like data, the chief data officer or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, their policy was that if it is not in the database, it does not exist. Right. So don't get mad at me when it doesn't show up in the report. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they, like that was their hardcore on like, mm -hmm. put it in the database. Right. And it was, and it just took, um, it, 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 uh, she also had um, gatekeeping, uh, control as well. Like if you're not putting it in right, then you're not going to put it in at all. 
uh, until you until you learn how to do it. But it's also there's so much dedication that you have to do to, to get to have someone to learn to, to do it. When I was looking at Neon, because we were considering switching databases, was that they seem so confident in their product that even when I was looking at like, okay, what's training like? Because I've got a couple of staff, I've got a good processor, I'm gonna have to learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we're gonna, there's like, you get four hours. And I'm like, you're so confident in your product that I could learn this in four, like, <laughs> learn it and do it all in four hours? Like, that's how much training I get? You get two 30 minute trainings a month. Okay. I've been doing them there and whatever. Yeah, well, and this is this is one of these situations too. Like if you get into a nonprofit and you find if you find yourself working for a nonprofit where outcomes and measurements matter, mm -hmm. but data management doesn't, like that is a that is a right there like, problem that's not going to solve itself because it's like oh it's all about outcomes and measurements. The database. I'm like no. Where, where do you think we're going to get this data from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I I wanted to ask. Um, and I think it, this might tie some of these together. Um, and I, I know I'm, we're also looking at the time. We've got maybe about yes. five or so minutes left. But um, the, the question is, two questions. If a nonprofit wanted to get uh, a consultant, and what you described is beautiful with putting it on the wall and let's draw out all the processes. Mm -hmm. A, first question, is there a name? I mean, there's you. But is there like, if we were like Googling it, a uh, process consultant for nonprofit, is there a name, A and B? Um, I also think of like when I go to my dentist, they're like, which, uh, no, one time I went to a dentist and he was like, which is more important, um, fixing it now? Or, you know, some kind of, uh, spectrum of decisions. Right. Do you like what are the when you go into a nonprofit? What's the spectrum of decisions? Is it money you want to spend versus what you know that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for the first question, in terms of like how to find a consultant, whichever software solutions you're looking for, it depends on what you're looking for. If you don't know AFP. The, the folks that go to AFP International, mm -hmm. pretty much all your donor databases are going to show up there. Mm -hmm. Salesforce is going to show up there. Like that's a great spot to find a list of databases out there if you're looking at that. But then if you have a consultant, I think, and this could be personal bias, but I think if you have a consultant that you've met, if you call me up and say, hey, I'm looking at X. And you say, are you a good fit for that? And they're like, oh, yeah, we're great at that. And they're like, could you give me three other people that are great at that as well that I can call? Because I think when you find a consultant, this is, again, all personal bias. When you find a consultant, you're finding someone you're going to be walking with for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And you should put as much energy in that, maybe not as much, but as close as energy into that as you would put into finding like a marriage partner. Like, yeah. you find somebody you're going to be OK with. Like, you know, yeah, find a good marriage partner. Like it's like you're because you were going to be together several years, and and you know you may break up at the end, and that's okay. Like everyone moves on, but but you but you're gonna want to find someone that fits well with the organization. And when you're talking to a consultant, most of the consultants that I know working on Salesforce are happy to give you the list a list of nonprofit technology network and ideal wear partner. And this, it's available online on both website, websites. Mm -hmm. Is the donor satisfaction survey for donor management systems mm -hmm. and the Salesforce is on there has been quite popular. Okay. And it okay. ranks some and it says what kind of nonprofit are you because you know it works mm -hmm. maybe better for the Intend.org and the oh, Idealware websites. So nice. I was wondering if you could. I, I kind of feel like I've only seen like what the apps do with Salesforce. I haven't seen actual Salesforce. Okay. And I was just wondering if you could just show, like, as a database administrator, I, I get asked, like, can you pull this report, this quarterly report on whatever program or something? Okay, so when it comes to reports? They do everything. I've sort of seen some of it. Well, you, you build your reports when it comes okay. to reports. Uh, so you get a lot of things by default on reports. But what I'm going to do is, and, I, and we might have to take, because I know we are three minutes and yeah. done. But I'm going to take you to a site that I love. It's trailhead.salesforce.com. <laughs> and it is Salesforce's free way of learning it. 
And so there's some, if you just go in and search for trails, you look for nonprofit. They'd like you to know they use cookies. So do you, I guess what, okay, so you build your own reports, but like, I don't have to build it every time, right? Oh no, you save it. Okay. And, and they, they send a ton of reports to you and then you look at them and use them as templates and then you tweak them. Okay. Yeah, so Salesforce comes and if you go to salesforce.org, so there's a trail here that'll show you the Salesforce basics for nonprofits. And if you go to salesforce.org, you can go over here to nonprofit file. Let's go up here to nonprofit success pack. I want to watch a video. But you can start it. So you can go in and pull it and you can play around with it. You can go through and do these, these trailheads and get a sense of what's, of what's going on. You can also find um, the nonprofit user group for Salesforce and pop in and just see what people are saying. Um, it's a, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of resources out there. And I've got my cards here and also a little, little thing about, about commentary services. And feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to connect you with, with resources if you just want to learn some more and find out what what all is in there. So, yeah, and I would say that if there's more questions, maybe one-on-one -on -one, y'all could, uh, you know, talk, and Terry has her, her business cards, okay. and so unless there's any other burning questions, I will say let's give Terry a round of applause. <laughs>